So the, the idea of the welfare state as a big contributor to income mobility is exaggerated. Wealthy trust fund babies are really good at regressing towards the mean. But I think the proper point is it's not as cost effective a way to promote social mobility as people believe it is. Our speaker, Vincent Geloso, is uh, an economic historian, studied economic history at the London School of Economics and uh, did his master's and PhD there, and is now a professor of economics at uh, George Mason University. Uh, we've met before. In, in a previous life, you were the, the president of the Hayek Society, is that right, at the LSE? Yes. You, you invited me, so uh, I'm glad we can return that favor. Um, social mobility topic of this evening. Let's start with some basic definitions so that we're clear what we're actually talking about. Uh, so what is social mobility? Uh, what are the different types maybe of social mobility and how do we measure that? So when we think of social mobility, we want to think of there's two types of social mobility. There is absolute mobility in the sense that we want to know over a certain period of time or over generations. So relative to your parents, if it's over generations, how much are extra income are you getting relative to whatever start point we define. That's absolute mobility. Uh, the other type of mobility would be relative mobility. So we all not only care how much extra you get, but are you climbing up the ladder? So if everyone gets an extra 50% relative to their parents, there is no relative mobility, but there's great absolute mobility. If somebody at the very bottom jumps up 200%, while on average everybody jumps 20%, that person enjoys absolute and relative mobility. So these are the two types of mobilities we want to talk about. Generally, the one that is the most measurable and captures most of what we would think as social mobility is income mobility. That captures pretty much most of the rest. Social mobility is a bit richer as a concept. You would include stuff like social class, status, but income pretty much captures, let's say, 90% of what we broadly define as social mobility. Right, so relative mobility is zero sum. If one person rises up, somebody else must come down. Yes, yeah. we can all, in theory, rise up. Correct. Okay. Um, why does it matter? It's one of those things uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who says, I'm against social mobility. It's one of those things that just seems obviously a good thing, but I still think it's worth spelling out. Why do we care about social mobility? So there is a direct reason to care. It's directly related to economic growth. So societies that have high levels of both absolute and relative mobility. It means that if I have a particular idea, say as an entrepreneur, and I'm in the bottom income, the uh, bottom of the income distribution, and I can climb from the top by providing a new good or a new service, I'm making everybody else better off. So I'm, and I get rich in the process. So this type of social mobility speaks to betterment and human living standards in general. Uh, but in addition, it speaks indirectly to other stuff we should care about. So why it should matter, why it's a good thing. Generally, high income mobility societies are more resilient liberal democracies. They resist better to exogenous shocks like, hypothetically, uh, pandemics or uh, uh, recessions. They're much more resilient to, uh, uh, they have fewer levels of social unrest. So generally, uh, high income mobility is uh, a very, very positive thing directly in the sense of economic growth, but indirectly through these other channels of what you could call robust political economy. Right. So it is related to the concept of meritocracy, meaning it is Correct. it has a, a, a utilitarian edge, I guess. So it can uh, it means that the people most capable are going to end up in a position where they should be, where they can do most useful things, uh, and also a question of legitimacy, that if people rise up, you have trust, and generally speaking, these are the people who should be in those positions. Yes, and actually I would point out that probably one of the best articles that's been published on this is by Finnis Welch in the 1999 American Economic Review, and it's called, very eloquently, In Defense of Inequality. And there is a passage that I keep citing every time I use, I talk about this, is uh, if if people view uh, if people are viewing that upward mobility is possible, levels of inequality are highly correlated tor uh, because there 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 is a perception that uh, people who got rich got rich by providing services, new goods, innovative purposes to others, uh, 
and not by rent seeking or by just dint of birth. So uh, there is a, and that's what, you, when you said legitimacy, that's the way I'm picturing it, is that uh, where there's high social mobility, uh, institutions are much more resilient to things that in other societies that have less income mobility would uh, cause weakening in terms when there's crisis uh, and less betterment in the long run. Right. So envy plays less of a role. You may be doing better Correct. than me, but I tolerate that. I think, well, fair enough. Good for you. I don't see you as being as you're in a zero-sum game thinking. Right. And how is, I mean, you're looking mostly here at international data. Uh, how is Britain doing when it comes to social mobility? Is Britain a fluid society where people can rise to the top? Is it more of a, there's often a perception that Britain is a fairly class-based, class-written, static society. Which is it? Is something in between? So within the, the pack of rich countries, Britain is middling. So it's not exceptional in any way. So it's not exceptionally good. It's not exceptionally bad. That is uh, the case. I, it's, it seems like it's doing okay-ish. But like most other Western countries, if I look over time, it is enjoying, and I say enjoying, it's a bad term, uh, it is experiencing a decline in both absolute mobility and relative mobility. So it seems like there's more persistence over time, but that is not unique to Britain. This is also seen in Canada, where I come from, the United States, France as well, uh, Germany. So it looks like for the West as a whole, there is a mild decline starting mid-70s or 80s. Yeah, there is often a perception. I've read this many times uh, about Britain specifically that the golden age uh, for social mobility was the post-war decades, the 1950s, 60s. Um, is that really true or is that mostly, does that come from a mixing up of relative and absolute mobility? Because this was, of course, a time when you had the creation of lots of uh, white-collar jobs where um, I guess this is more about social class than income and where you can have a lot of upwards mobility when people who would previously have been factory workers are now getting an office job. And so uh, there you can have um, the middle class, so defined, can just generally grow and and uh, at, and you don't get to zero sum mobility. You can have lots of people rising without anyone coming down. So the, the idea of the welfare state as a big contributor to income mobility is exaggerated. And the reason why is generally that the highest quality data starts at the same time that the welfare state starts emerging. But when we look at older data, when it's possible, and we can look over it over time, we find that, for example, Jason Long in some articles in the European Review of Economic History finds that actually there was the same amount of social mobility in the late Victorian era as there was at the height of the British welfare state. Right. Uh, so, And you can think of the difference in technologies between those two points in time differences in uh, sets of resources that are available to people, you would expect that it should have gone up just by virtue of technological advances in some ways, uh, but it didn't. So I think we can underplay the importance of the welfare state. Not that given the amount of spending that it did nothing, it would be highly depressing if it didn't, but I think the proper point is it's not as cost effective a way to promote social mobility as people believe it is what's the oldest data you ever come across because i, I would imagine surely in, in pre-industrial pre-capitalist societies social mobility would have been very low or even early stages of industrialization so some economic historians are able to go back much further but only for very narrow region uh but uh, for the united states for example we find that uh we can go as far back as the 1860s and we find that uh, the period from so either it started high and declined from 1870 to, and then you could, it's not a continuous decline since we only have like a few data points from say 1870 to 1940, seems like it's pretty much stable up to 1940 or increasing according to some revisions. And since the 1940s, it looks like it has mildly declined. So uh, the pattern seems to suggest that the, there was... In, and I'm using the Victorian era and the pre-1940 in the United States as period of freer markets. I wouldn't say free markets, but period of freer markets where there was, especially given the low, the different level of technologies available back then, which you can think as constraints on upward mobility, the setup was actually much, there was historically much more level 
much greater levels of upward mobility than we appreciate, which goes back to why I keep pointing out that the welfare state is not as cost effective as people think it is at promoting social mobility, especially since uh, the state is highly schizophrenic in the way it does things. So social welfare spending generally has some effect. I don't think cost effective, but it will have some effect. But then it does a series of intervention in markets that are highly regressive and push people down and limit their ability to rise up. Uh, that overall, like a first do no arm approach would actually be more productive. And yeah, we'll come to that. That is the main conclusion. Yeah, that, uh, uh, before, I'm jumping. Before we get to that, uh, and I'm guessing part of the reason why you wrote this, uh, when you were at the LSE, you, you will re uh, remember the spirit level. That was the most, possibly the most influential political yes. book uh, in the beginning of the last decade. And well, I, ga I guess uh, they gave uh, prominence to that issue of social mobility because they have that scatter plot saying actually the biggest determinant of social mobility is inequality. Um, the problem I had with the book, even at the time, was they never quite explained the causal mechanism. Why should this be the case that more unequal societies are also less mobile? So the, the way they have this metaphor, they said, well, imagine a ladder, uh, an unequal society would be a ladder where the rungs are further apart. Well, okay, yeah, that's, that's a good metaphor, but what do I do with that? How do I apply that to an actual economy? How does that explain why wouldn't that, wouldn't it just mean a given career move in a more unequal society makes a bigger difference? So a better analogy than theirs to make their argument so we're not straw, man straw manning their position is that the lower rungs are further apart than the upper rungs. That's the way they're trying to picture it. Uh, and the idea is that this means that there's more constraints on the poor. That's the gist of their argument. But when you start digging into it, it doesn't really hold. Uh, and I'll give you a microcosm I've studied. And the key conclusion here is in highly free societies and strong liberal democratic, liberal democracies, and I define liberal democracies as well, democratic and high levels of economic freedom, uh, you find that there is no relationship. And the microcosm I use was, uh, weirdly enough, it was a microcosm from the Olympics. So the idea is if you look at the Olympics, you would get a setup where you have people who are innately skilled. And, and this is randomly distributed, has nothing to do with your bird position in life. And you would expect that this, uh, if there's more inequality, people who have to develop these innate skills who are poor will get fewer chances to develop. So countries with high inequality will send athletes that are on average less talented. So the talented poor don't get the chance to develop their skills. And so highly inequal country, highly unequal countries would win fewer medals. So it looks like it's a microcosm in, in a way to test this that I use. But when we qualify the statement, okay, what happens if we look at countries that are exceptionally economically free? Then while there is an effect of inequality, the effect of inequality is overswamped and dominated by the effect of highly high high level property rights. Why? Because secure property rights motivates efforts. It means that if I can appropriate the fruits of any investments I make in my own skills, well then I'm going to earn much more than otherwise is the case. If there's secure property rights, there's also a mechanism for other people to invest in me. Uh, and so what you find in the set of taxes are low as well, net return from any efforts are also higher. So what you have is that on average, economically free societies are able to overswamp and overpower any noxious effects that inequality might have. Going back to my initial point that in free societies, there is inequality doesn't do much harm. And also the point that I point out earlier, tolerance for inequality in high societies is generally high. And the reason for this is people can climb up the ladder so that whatever income disparities we observe are actually reflecting general productiveness, generally meritocratic or skill-based uh, relationships, rather than what you could call generally under the broader heading of rent-seeking. Right. Was nepotism uh, the sort of thing that would uh, stop or, or constrain social mobility? Is something that's very much a human impulse. Uh, if you can, of course, uh, you're going to give preference to people you know and like, uh, rather than, say, purely meritocratic hiring. That's something that goes against human nature, it's something that we do when we have no other choice. Is it fair to say that, therefore, in, in an economy where, say, most sectors 
of the economy are more dynamic, competitive. You have to do the right thing or otherwise a competitor who does will push you out. Is that a reason why you, you, you would expect a, a positive correlation between economic freedom and social mobility? Yes, that would be one way. So there's the fact that you're not putting hurdles in, in people's way. But there's also the fact that economic growth is itself enhancing because in and I can accept part of the the mechanism of the spirit level delusion uh, to quote uh, Chris Snowden on this uh, that there is stricter constraints uh, for the poor. If you're poor, it constrains your opportunity to rise upward. But if you have economic growth, and let's say like there's just like an extra level of income marginally extra units of income mar matter much more at a marginal rate for the poor than it does for the rich. You're increasing their chances much more. You can see it, for example, in the income elasticity of education. If you bump up a dollar for a poor person, the person will invest much more in extra skills than the rich person. So you're probably going to get with economic growth much more upward mobility. And since economic freedom is related to growth, then there's an indirect effect afterwards on mobility in the long run. So there's not putting hurdles in people's way, and then there's the indirect effect of stimulating economic growth. Right, okay. I also remember there was a passage in the spirit level where they, I can't remember where it was, they, they talk about some neighborhood where they say this is a place where they have a, a culture where uh, aspiration is looked down upon and uh, being interested in career advancement and things like that is seen as posh and pretentious. And that made me wonder, okay, but what does that have to do with inequality or economic policies? Isn't there a cultural angle there that um, to what extent is social mobility really the product of, say, economic policies, economic institutions, as opposed to different cultural attitudes? So you could have groups which are more or less content with their lot, which don't have the ambition for their children to be to do differently, whereas others might be, we see that this might be a difference why we have big differences uh, might be a reason why we have big differences uh, between different groups of immigrant communities. Like some are very upwardly mobile, others far less so. So I would say that I see culture more as a second order effect, that it's the result of previous institutions. So for example, if we look at East Germans and West, West Germans, uh, at the time of reunification, there is a large degree of cultural differences between both groups. And today, if you look at preferences for redistribution or political preferences of East Germans, they're still different from West Germans. But if you track those differences over time, they have collapsed to not like not to non-existent, but by a fair degree, they've, they've withstood. So the idea that they've, they've withdrawn. And the idea here is that if, uh, if you picture culture more as an outcome of institutions, that people shape their cultural expectation as a result of living for long periods under an unfree regime or under a freer regime, the cultural attitudes will match this. Mm -hmm. Now, if you move overnight to a more liberal regime, it's not going to be true that culture adjusts overnight to the same degree. There's some degree of inelasticity, but what we can, what we observe is that generally uh, living longer under, under liberal democratic settings, especially with high levels of economic freedom, generally causes improvements in cultural attitudes. If you want to go full Deidre McCluskey here, you could think of bourgeois virtues, and uh, that would be kind of the way I'm, I'm picturing this. Not saying that culture has no role, but I don't give it the first causal link in the chain of factors. Well, there's nothing wrong with going full Deidre McCluskey. Uh, <laughs> it's just that I'm by no means an expert on the subject, but I know that some of the people who are um, say soci sociologists who have looked at social mobility, I know that there is a camp of people who believe that there isn't much that you can do about it. Uh, that So there, there was one paper where uh, they looked at uh, mobility in China over a century or so, and where you had this extreme case. Uh, you had, of course, in the Maoist period where they were actively persecuting um, the, the rich people, the, the upper class at, uh, at the time, um, expropriating them in, in, in a lot of cases, uh, physically exterminating them. And where they're saying nowadays, you can see that some of the groups, uh, some of the surnames, uh, the, the family surnames uh, from the pre-Mao era, uh, the families that were doing well then, are doing well again, that there was a, a bounce back effect. And they're saying, therefore, with social mobility, 
don't even try. Most of it is just fairly fixed. Nothing much you can do about that. What's your so, take on that? So I'll go full economist here. I think of elasticities all the time. And elasticities is the percentage change in prices over the percentage change in quantities. If you give me a small percentage change in prices, well, I'm expecting a small percentage change, unless it's highly elastic in quantities. Uh, China is not my picture of a country that went from historically free institutions to unfree and back to free. I'm thinking more of a country that went from unfree to super unfree to unfree, uh, which is not a great elasticity. It's, I'm not expecting a huge shock to, to settings like this. However, uh, countries that have done large reforms... Uh, for example, uh, I'm thinking, so I have an example of a paper that's, that's a working paper of mine for Alberta and Canada. So Alberta and Canada did in 1990s, a crazy set of reform. They cut spending by 30% relative to on a per capita basis. They privatize a lot of sectors. It went from, in the freedom, the economic freedom ranking of the Fraser Institute went from, from being a middling area, a bit like Britain, uh, to the freest place in North America, economically speaking. And Every measure of income mobility jumped up causally. So if you do what is known as synthetic control methods, you find that uh, the province went up in terms of income mobility, while every other province was actually declining. Uh, so Alberta became kind of the hub. So, But this was a huge shock, huge shock, huge elasticity, more visible, lasting effects. That would be my answer to your your point is how big of a shock to to the institutional environment are you getting and we are underestimating the importance of institutions and i guess that gets me to my last question uh, the policy recommendations let's say if we i think we used to have probably still have a social mobility tsar as often when the government when they don't know what to do they appoint a tsar who's was leading some expert committee. Sound, sounds like it's going to improve things but <laughs> tsars were well now to make things better in russia that's what's super happening. well now but if you were the social mobility tsar and let's say you, you will probably be a very short lift. Uh, yes, I, I, mean, expect that. I very much expect that. You would get the conventional tower treatment, but say, what would you I'd be a great that, that, like, that short time for? Say, you have, let's say, maybe just this evening. Well, what are your recommendations? Two, ma two magic bullets, occupational licensing, uh, reform. Occupational licensing in every country is going up, but in the UK, it's particularly egregious in terms of the increase. Roughly one in five job in the US requires pretty burdensome uh, upfront licensing, uh, generally very costly procedures, uh, amounting to many months of foregone income to just get the license, uh, plus the cost of the license itself. Uh, that generally falls. So there's work by Brian Meehan and Alicia Plemons out of West Virginia University, um, uh, where they're pointing out that uh, if you look at in the, the regulations of low income groups, of low-income professions, the degree of regulation dramatically reduces absolute and relative income mobility by a very large degree. That's the first one. The second one is housing. Uh, and people really need to understand this, how like cities are hubs of opportunities. If you don't make them open, you're locking people in particular places. The byproduct of that is you're locking them in their income groups you're preventing them from accessing this because any gains in productivity of cities ends up being capitalized in housing prices. Yes. And then is a wealth transfer to the existing homeowners. And the hubs of opportunity do not become accessible to lower income groups. If you think about, for example, American economic history, there is the period known as the Great Migration, where a large number of black Americans move from the South to the North in a very rapid period of time. And in that period, there is clear signs of upward income mobility for Americans on average, and especially black Americans. And they're moving to the North and the cities. If you look at like the housing stock of New York, of Chicago, of Boston, it is going up very fast because the land, the, the supply of housing is allowed to adjust to inflowing demands. Imagine now a counterfactual where you say, we're going to have the same land use regulations that we had back then. You're locking people in the poor southern states of the United States. You're locking them in the low opportunities, er the low opportunity areas. You're creating no incentives for the state level governments to improve their policies because they're not losing people. They're not losing tax revenues. So there's no institutional improvement. And at the same time, places that have better policies don't get rewarded. 
So it's like a very vicious circle of when we're doing housing regulations, the amount of what you could call spatial misallocation of preventing people who have skills who could be employed in cities at a high rate at the same time would produce more income mobility is the most egregious of the the ways we uh, depress income mobility. Uh, if you look at throughout the literature, it is the one consistent finding that place matters a great deal. Going to places, I should say, yeah. matters a great deal for income mobility. So countries like the UK, which is also very egregious, not, now that, and that it is not middling. Uh, <laughs> Canada is really good at it too, but it's probably the British tradition. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry to rip on Britain on this, but uh, no, you've come to the right place. I, I'm, I'm very happy to. <laughs> so this case, absolutely deserved. Yeah, uh, I uh, Toronto is really good in Canada for restricting housing, but the result is you're locking people into low opportunity places, mm -hmm. and you're preventing them from jumping up the ladder. Liberalizing the housing supply and land use regulation, and just basically follow a build baby build approach. Uh, would be probably the one silver, one magic bullet uh, that would uh, that would promote uh, social mobility and income mobility in a uh, stupendous way if it was enacted. Now, oh. how to do it's hard and harder question. Well, yeah, yeah, we're working on that. But it's one of those things where uh, it improved social mobility could then almost be a side effect of things that you should do anyway to improve overall yes, activity. And also, it doesn't have to cost anything. You know, these are things that are common, zero fiscal costs. But I would go back to the, in the initial point is the importance of social mobility, especially in the wake of COVID. In the wake of COVID, we've had uh, uh, a, a really large increase in governments and, and government size. And the fear of many people is how much of a, of a permanent increase this would be. And the issue is the shock actually causes a, a permanent illiberal move, if you want. High mobility societies are able to withstand that shock. The, because if you look, for example, so I have work on the economics of pandemics, uh, like every economist during COVID. Uh, nothing else to do. Yeah, nothing else to do. I was stuck at home, to uh, one kid uh, uh, and a young kid. But anyways, uh, uh, it reduces the, the size of the contraction. The length of the contraction uh, reduces the excess mortality as well. So it makes the shock milder, more manageable, less protracted. So that means that if there's a shock that happens, it's more manageable for an economy. Add in social mobility to this, the importance of it is also it withstands in the long run the, the liberal democratic order, if you want. Promoting income mobility is in of itself a way to preserve the what makes the West, a great idea that produces amazing outcomes. Brilliant stuff. This is all music to my ears. Uh, let's let's open this to the floor. If you have any questions, uh, we have a I can take insults too. <laughs> I'm Canadian. I'm used so to that it. might be some. Uh, yes, gentlemen over here, and the first row. Thank you. Uh, as artificial intelligence continues to outperform humans in task after task, especially for higher paid white collar jobs. What do you think the impacts of this are on social mobility in the medium run and the long run? And in this world, does economic freedom and an increase in economic freedom still increase social mobility um, as a potentially AGI outperforms humanity in a wider range of tasks and returns are much greater to capital than they are to labor. Okay. So first answer, there's two parts of my answer to your question. Number one is I'm willing to bet a thousand dollars that, uh, once we'll measure the effect of, uh, of, of artificial intelligence on social economic outcome, and it will actually be pro unskilled workers, largely because what I, AI does is replace, it's mostly affecting white collars. So there are periods where we find in economic history periods where technological change is biased towards low skilled labor. And here I can think of that we'll notice that wages for people at the bottom of the income distribution will be positively affected by AI much more than through the middle. Now, the other part is the damages. So that's a second part of my answer, the damages that technological change generates. And it's not that there's damages in the long run, but every change causes rearrangement of resources and it's a friction. Friction is a cost. And 
how much friction you're putting is actually entirely a function of how much barriers you put to people retraining. So if you're putting a high cost of retraining into another domain because you put occupational licensing, you're bound to make any technological change harder to bear. So there's, I'm going to give you a preview of a working paper I'm doing with one of my grad students is there's a paper that shows that automation reduced social mobility. And what we did is, okay, let's just condition this on the level of occupational licensing in the different states or different commuting zones in the U.S. for which income mobility is estimated. Oh, and guess what do we find is in the places where there's low occupational licensing, automation had no effect on social mobility. Only where there was high occupational licensing is there an effect because what occupational licensing does is create more friction and thus damage people more. Is that exhaustive as answer? Okay, gentleman over here. Hello. I uh, skimmed through your um, document. and uh, Sorry about that. Yeah, but, uh, but, uh, because I'm in preparation for this evening. But my central question is, why didn't you suggest the idea of um, um, economic zones, uh, entrepreneurial, I think it was economic zones that um, Art Laffer suggested uh, around about 2000, and enterprise zones, that's it. Why didn't you suggest that as a possible solution? Uh, because, first of all, I, I didn't think of that as a solution because I was thinking of the two largest ones that could have an impact, uh, housing deregulation and occupational deregulation. But at the same time, there's a way to encompass your idea within those two. Saying that, like, here's an area of London, say, for example, where there will be no building codes. Like, I'm exaggerating for the sake of their hyperbole, but that would actually generate part of what I'm discussing. But it could be part of also like just widespread liberalization. All right. So a step towards liberalization, what I'm saying is good. Doing multiple steps towards it is better. Uh, and you're asking me to do one step. I'm happy to do it with you. I'd be happy if it was done. Uh, I would like multiple steps though. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So there would be an enterprise zone. It would just be the whole country. I could, if I could make it bigger than one country, I'd be happier still. Even better. A uh, question from Daniel here. Uh, yes, hello. I just want to uh, uh, say I agree with everything you said on uh, uh, planning reform and land use. But, um, you know, talking about that here is like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, what one of the points I found interesting in your your paper is you're mostly trying to measure social mobility through um, uh, income mobility, and is there a concern on on your part that actually the um, the inf uh, the increase in house prices actually makes that a less useful measure of actual social mobility and standards of living? Because say if you're in in London and you're earning say forty thousand um, pounds, you might be significantly worse off than someone earning say twenty five thousand pounds who happens to have inherited inherited a house yeah. from from their their parents. Um, so is the like is there any way that you'd go about sort of trying to correct for that in future research? So this is a really good question. I expect that it causes an issue, but I'm not sure how big of an issue it is because uh, stocks can be used to generate flows. So I can use my, I can mortgage, say, part of my house to generate an income or a loan for a business that I start. It has an ability to, to, to then correlate with income, which is a flow. So I expect some relationship between them over the long run. Over the short run, I expect some in the like movement that look like they're contradictory, but I expect them they're just short run mechanism. In the long run, I expect that they'll move together. And you can see this when you look at wealth or income inequality, they seem to move in the very long run together. Year to year, not really, but in the long run, strong go movements because the two are insanely related. Question from Philip. Thanks. I mean, a couple of totally different questions, really. The, the first is, is there any influence at all of inheritance tax or estate duties on relative social mobility? Um, and the second is related to the point you made about culture. Do, I mean, do, 
Um, is, is it not apparent that in, in different immigrant groups you often get quite different um, economic outcomes which endure through generations? And Does that suggest that uh, culture might be important or, or is there something different going on there? So I, when I think of culture, I'm going to refer to uh, a paper that I really like by uh, Potterman and Weil. And they don't speak of culture, they speak of state history. And the idea is your historical, your culture has a very large function with your experience with previous states. If you grew up and your family grew up and everyone grew up in a very hostile, institutionally hostile environment, your cultural preferences will reflect this. And the weight of the past does matter. I, I'm, I As an economic historian, I think we often over-exaggerate this determinism, but it would be foolish to say that it's not there. But for example, if you look at Cubans in the United States, they do very well. They do above average, insanely well. Uh, and the reason why is Cubans didn't have a very long period of very bad institutions. Whereas if you uh, take Russians, for example, they have a longer history of this. So I could check and see that these differences look like they're cultural but more often than not, they speak to this state ancestry or state history index uh, that matters a great deal. So it's not as much what I would talk about as culture as how long have you incorporated zero sum thinking that comes from unfree settings and that in freer settings, zero sum thinking is less prevalent and that there's more positive sum games happening and people's cultural expectations adapt. Now, they can adapt more slowly because of a larger, longer weight of the past or more faster in the case of like East and West Germans. But I, I don't, it's not that I'm dismissing culture, it's that I am not giving it, it's the first causal move. I would say if you play with institutions and are able to withstand uh, a strong liberal order for a long period of time, you will see that all groups, even those that start far back, will converge uh, upwards, if, if, if that conveys my point a bit better. With regards to inheritance taxes, uh, the literature is actually pretty surprisingly like divided on this. I think the case is stronger theoretically that they don't promote income mobility because bequests are particularly important for poor people. Uh, and uh, wealthy trust fund babies are really good at regressing towards the mean. Uh, people keep forgetting this is they're very good at this. Uh, I, I've seen many cases of this. There is a legendary case in Montreal where I grew up for, but if you end up taxing estates, you end up, uh, reducing the ability of poorer households to legate something that, uh, for their kids and that estate marginally matters more for the very poor. So disproportionately the effect is stronger on the poor. I know Edward Wolf, who is no libertarian or no classical liberal, has made that case that uh, there are many setups, not all the setups, he does defend some form of taxation, but there are many setups in which wealth taxes end up being depressing for income mobility across generations. Anyone else? Yes, here in the back. You mentioned a couple of times that uh, countries with high social mobility were better placed to deal with the pandemic. Uh, is that more so just than pure wealth of the country? Oh, interested because you mentioned it a couple of times. Yes. So I'm not, I, I, I don't want to claim originality here. I got, uh, I started that research strand of mine from stuff Christian Zornskov has made. And he has a paper, and I'll just like summarize it really well. He looks at, I think like seven different types of crises, financial, epidemiological, uh, uh, major riots. He then checks, okay, from peak to trow, how much of an economic contraction are you getting? Uh, earthquakes as well, like natural disaster, how much of a contraction you're getting? So how deep is, are you falling? How long until you return to where you were before? What he finds is generally all types of shocks, less of a dip, faster recovery. So shorter crisis as well. So he finds that this is the general thing. Pandemics are just one of those types of exogenous shocks that are not the result of policy per se. They just come out, shock the system, 
and how does the system respond to this? Uh, if you want, I'll promote my own work. I have a paper on in contemporary economic policy on the 1918 pandemic, uh, where we point out that countries that, so one for an index of economic freedom from zero to 10, one point of economic freedom was mitigating 15% of the effect of, uh, of an excess mortality, of, uh, of excess mortality. So whatever the effect of excess mortality is, one extra point would cut 15% of it. Uh, and it's, it was a big deal. Uh, so it mitigates, it has the ability to mitigate the damages of shocks. Income mobility gets you the extra on top. So it's not just the institutions per se, it's afterwards people will perceive the outcomes that come out as being legitimate. That there, the out, that there is not someone who got the better end of a straw because somebody got screwed somewhere. Like it's, it's, it limits the ability of thinking about the, of the world in terms of zero sum games. Anyone else? Daniel again. Um, so often when politicians talk about, uh, social mobility, one of the first sort of- They generally say bullshit. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that's not limited to social mobility. Answered. Yeah, well, that's not limited. Yes, you you may have already answered my question, but one of one of the first levers they usually go to is, ah, oh, well, we need to spend more on schools and education, particularly on uh, in in poorer areas. Um, education isn't one of the thing one of the things you mentioned as the sort of keys to increasing social mobility. Um, is that because you think it's basically all money draft down? No, that would be, that would be incorrect. So I, so I think there's such a thing as like too much welfare state. I do believe that there's some form of redistributive policies that could be defended on the pure ground of income mobility. But the point I made earlier is it's, it's cost effectiveness. So people think of income mobility through education as being only positive, but you have to fund the transfers in some ways. And that means higher taxes and higher taxes have an effect, especially when it's on education. An investment in education is highly uncertain because you can't have half of the asset. You need to have the entire degree or it's worthless. So people in high uncertainty environments over completion, it is a huge deterrent, the uncertainty over this. Tax rate exponentially increase that deterrent. So the effect of high tax, yes, I'm getting transfers, but the higher tax rates re end up reducing the net returns. So it reduces the incentive to undertake the effort of going to school. So what's generally emphasized by politicians is like, oh, all the good sides. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. And if you throw enough money at a problem, eventually, like the Russians, you'll get to space. Uh, but what you'll get is not necessarily the most cost-effective way of allocating resources is you end up having this downside, this trade-off, and there's no such thing as a free lunch. You end up having this trade-off where people are, there's less mobility. So the net effect is closer to zero. I don't think it's negative, but I don't think it's what, I ends up being sold, especially compared with the much net clearer effect of deregulating occupations, deregulating housing. So you make places more accessible and jobs less costly to assess. Do you give any credence to the idea that perhaps um, it, leaving aside funding, perhaps the structure of education yeah. can play a role? So. Um, it, it's sometimes claimed in, in the UK by supporters of uh, the grammar school system, which was was this kind of system, of, I don't know if you're familiar with it in the US, where you basically had tests for pretty much all children at the ages of 11 or 13 in some areas. And then um, those who perform the best in those tests get to go to highly academic schools and then others don't. Um, the 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 sort of golden age of grammar schools is from really the end of the second world war through to the sort of late 60s early 70s and that seems to coincide with you know what's sometimes seen as the golden age of social mobility um do you do you give any credence to the idea that some of you know grammar schools or things like that may have played a role in social mobility or is it just so, i don't want to commit on the grammar school stuff uh because my familiarity with this, I'm Canadian, yeah. right? So I'm, uh, I'm one of those rednecks. Uh, but I would say it like, like this, there's a distinction to be made between intervention and redistribution. 
So intervention in markets, generally highly regressive. Redistribution, there is a case pre, uh, prima facie that can be made. But generally what happens is as soon as the case for redistribution is made, there's an automatic on some people that it means state provision as well. There is no automatic reason that we should think that some funding of education requires state provision of education. It's entirely possible to have, for example, competitive education. So parents get some funding, vouchers, and they can choose the school and there's private providers and you get entrepreneurship and education and you could probably get much greater returns this way than otherwise is the case. Uh, so that would fall under restructuring, but by introducing competitive mechanism in inside the market. So I think the case to be made is that when I say the welfare state is not that cost effective, if you throw enough money at a problem, you're bound to get at least on that problem better outcomes. It's it just it comes at a cost and it's on other dimensions will be visible. Introducing competition for these services is a way to actually increase the cost effectiveness of uh, of whatever dollar, sorry, pound is spent on this, it's telling you that I'm not from Britain. Uh, I think this is a better way to think about it is uh, I'm not making any strong claims against the welfare state, except that it's highly cost ineffective, uh, but not against its very existence per se, or at least in the financing of some of some services like education. The voucher system, the classics. The, the classic remains a classic. Question over here. Hi, uh, thank you very much. My question relates to the role of family and family taxation in the context of social mobility. And I'm wondering whether in the UK, given that it seems like we have a more individualized tax system, which to a certain extent penalizes marriage, family formation compared to a place like France or Germany, to what extent then measuring social mobility by income mobility creates quite a complex picture where you could have a situation where someone is potentially becoming more upwardly mobile in terms of income and already more than their parents did, but in doing so ends up in a situation where actually it's quite difficult to recreate sort of family situation they came from. And in some ways, actually, there's a sort of disincentive towards earning over a certain amount or creating a situation where one is, is taxed in a punitive way because of the individualized system. So I'm wondering to what extent there's a what ratio is in your view between income mobility and other forms of kind of almost social or family reproduction um, in the UK in that sense? Okay, so I'm going to point you to work by James Heckman. So I'm going to take like a small deviation before answering your question. So Heckman and his co-author, whose Danish name I cannot pronounce, uh, it's, it's a great paper in the Journal of Labor Economics. And here's the, the, the essential of it. If you compare intergenerational income mobility in the United States and Denmark, the United States matches Denmark, despite the big welfare state in in Denmark. The point Heckman and his co-author make is that parental influence are a huge deal. The influence of early family settings matter a big deal. In this case, your question would be any policies that end up hurting family formation, right? That end up making it harder for households to stick together. So any disincentive for a parent to be with his kid or spend more time with his kid. So it doesn't include like just the size of the family as if I have to, for example, like work longer hours uh, just to like, say for example, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, uh, no congestion pricing. So I'm stuck in traffic longer. That has a deterrent effect. The result is I spend less time with my kids. My kids are a bit hurt by this. They don't get the same engagement. The result is less income mobility. Any policies that end up hurting family influences will matter. Yours is one of that set of policies that I would think, if it's I take it on face value, what you're saying about the effect of the British system, that would how I that's how I would classify it. Uh, that's the other part that's a bit outside policy because family influences is again second order effect, a bit like culture, but you can in fact you can you can you can affect it very dramatically, directly or indirectly by policy. Sorry for the roundaboutness of the answer. Like I had to go through Denmark for this one. Anyone else? Yes, here in front. Uh, just following up on your last point, which I, I totally agree with, it does seem to me that we've created a society where both parents are expected to go out to work. 
Now, that doesn't help your point, which is that family influence is terribly important. So should we be trying to arrange our affairs more to encourage at least one parent to spend much more time with their children? So here's one way I would phrase it. It's uh, how much is like, for example, the cost of working. So like in the United States, one of the bigger issues is uh, cost of daycare. Cost of daycare, highly regulated. Uh, sorry, uh, daycare services are highly regulated and there's a huge effect of the regulations on child care costs. Uh, the, the One of the weird effects that it has is that it actually causes parents to uh, work more later. So the mom, for example, takes off from the market, loses some of the value of her education, and then works longer hours when she picks up on the labor market back up to compensate for any wealth deterrence there is. So there is an amount of, and you can think of the example I just gave you, is if you find ways to reduce the cost of labor, like for example, removing occupational licensing, uh, you will end up having an indirect effect on how much time I end up being able to spend time with my kids. So even if I'm working, it's the cost, the extra cost government imposes on working that is causing part of the problem. The rest is personal choices of whether or not you want to work or whether or not you want to stay more time with your kids. And that is something I am very reluctant to say any policy recommendation on this, largely because I do, want, do not want to enable any politician to act on any recommendation in that direction. Very sensible. On that note, let's draw the formal proceedings to a close. Thank you all for attending.